Hey everyone, welcome back to Here in Apologetics. I'm super pumped to join us today to have Dr. Ted Poston. He's a professor and the director of the McCullough Institute for Pre-Medical Ed- Education, part of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Alabama. Today we're going to be looking at a fun topic, the intrinsic probability of theism. So Dr. Poston, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on. I'm always happy to talk to uh, people about you know, philosophy and especially about some of these ideas to in philosophy of religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I'm super excited for this. Um, and I think it's a really interesting question looking at like intrinsic probability and like looking at like theism and atheism and axiarchism and all these fun views that we're going to dive into today. So to start things off, Dr. Poston, do you want to talk a little bit about like who you are, what you do, and like what got you interested in like topics like this? Yeah, sure. So um, I come from uh, academic background. My dad was um, a biologist uh, studying at the University of Chicago. And when he was going to do his field research in Africa, he met my mom and decided that he wanted to uh, be a pastor instead. Hmm. And so I grew up in uh, my household where, you know, my dad was a pastor, but he was also a part time college professor. And so I'd always been really interested um, in the connection between science and religion. Uh, And, you know, to make a long story short, when I went to college, I had a philosophy professor that introduced me to you know, people like Bill Craig and uh, <clears throat> Ravi Zacharias and, you know, Francis Schaeffer. And I was just really fascinated with some of the ideas there. Um, and when I got into grad school to study philosophy, I was able to work with Richard Swinburne. Um, I was really impressed with his use of broadly, you know, scientific reasoning explicated in terms of probability theory and the use of Bayesianism to model some of the arguments, uh, traditional arguments in philosophy of religion. And so I've been working on that off and on for the past, you know, however many years I've been a professor. Uh, So um, my hope is that um, I will finally finish this book that I'm working on, which is, uh, you know, continuing sort of the Swinburne project. Mm -hmm. So looking at the Swinburne project, maybe I'll start with this, um, Dr. Poston. How was like, you talked about like Bill Craig and like you got like, I'm sure people are familiar with like the Kalam and like his fine tuning argument and whatnot. Mm -hmm. How is his project different than like the Swinburneian project and the project you're trying to bring forward here? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I tend to think of um, Craig's work more in the line of the traditional Aquinas project where you're interested in um, trying to find a valid you know, deductive argument uh, from premises that are plausible, you know, plausibly known to the claim that, you know, there's a God. Um, And I think, you know, I mean, Craig definitely does have some other arguments, you know, his use of fine tuning reasoning, for example, that fits more into, you know, a probabilistic framework. But um, one thing that's distinct about Swinburne's project is that it's a cumulative case project, you know, and so he's really concerned with framing these issues in terms of Bayesian reasoning and then looking at the evidence in terms of, you know, how it changes your prior on theism. And as that sort of, as more and more evidence comes in, how you update that in accord with Bayes' theorem. So I think, you know, in a way, Swinburne's project is, um, you know, more uh, sort of theoretically unified uh, than uh, the way Craig is thinking about some of these issues. Mm. So that's super helpful, Dr. Poston. Um, And I think a lot of people, like when they first get into like this whole like science, religion, apologetics, all this fun stuff, it's like Craig's approach um, is kind of what is brought forward. Um, But I've seen definitely a lot more people shift towards like this more of like this Swinburnian approach. Uh, and mm-hmm. I've heard of other people talking about like you and your work on intrinsic probability is like something that's kind of like pushing them even further in that direction. So I'd love to start off today, Dr. Poston, just talking about like um, what is intrinsic probability before we get into like, why should we worry about it? Like, what is it in general? Yeah. So just think about an ordinary case of, you know, maybe legal reasoning, you know, you're trying to figure out, you know, crimes have been committed and you're trying to figure out, okay, so what are some plausible theories? Um Uh, that would, you know, that we should look at, right? And there's that sort of, you know, first stage of where you're trying to identify plausible theories, right? You're really just, you know, it's even sort of before you look at the evidence, you're just thinking, okay, what are some plausible theories that would account uh, that we should look at that, you know, we're going to look at to see how well it accounts for the evidence. Mm 
right? And that um, the idea that you can come up with, you know, sort of a range or competing theories before you're looking at the evidence uh, that tracks the intrinsic probability or the probability of the theories before you look at the evidence. Mm. Yeah. So in terms of philosophy or religion, uh, you might think, okay, so what are the, before we look at how particular views account for, you know, things like the uh, existence of consciousness or, you know, the appearance of design in the world, we want to know, well, what are just some plausible views to consider? And there you just think about these really big, you know, metaphysical views that um, try to explain reality as it is. Mm. So intrinsic probability is kind of like the idea that we're looking at, like, um, like that, like, like, what are the odds this idea is true before we're actually like, looking at like the data or like the evidence, um, like when we're looking at like design or like the beginning of the universe, like things like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, you know, maybe if you go into, um, you know, like, a, um, you go to Las Vegas and you're interested in, you know, checking out like uh, roulette tables, you know, before you even walk in, you might say, well, how plausible it is, is it that there's a roulette table that has like two, you know, segments to it or three, you know, and you might not know a whole lot, but you're like, well, you know, probably got a lot. And then, you know, so you can kind of come up with a range of, you know, different hypotheses that are roughly plausible equally plausible and then you go and you you see and you're like oh okay so this is what um a roulette table looks like mm, i like that it's like setting the stage for like what what are the odds of this roulette table before we roll the ball so like why should we worry then about intrinsic probability yeah so um this is where it would have been nice to be able to figure out how to share my screen mm -hmm. uh so if you think about um just Bayes' theorem so Bayes' theorem just tells you how you should update your evidence in accord with um, uh, hi, sorry, how you should update a hypothesis in accord with some evidence. Uh, so it's the probability of H given E. And the cool thing is, is like, if you're inter if you have two theories, for example, and you're interested in just comparing uh, how the evidence uh, bears on those two theories, you can sort of set them up as a ratio, and then you can use Bayes' theorem to expand that out um, and so when you do that, you get two, um, uh, two separate ratios. One uh, is called the likelihood ratio. And all that it is is, you know, how probable the evidence is given the theory, given one theory and comparing that to how probable the evidence is given the other theory. And then the other part of it is just a comparison of the relative plausibility or probability of the two theories. Right. So if you use that as sort of a guiding model for uh, the evidential impact of evidence on a theory, it really neatly separates out two items. There's the comparison of the intrinsic probabilities of the theory, and then there's the comparison of how well the theory explains the relevant evidence. Mm -hmm. So that's super helpful, kind of looking at like, we have like this like, probability of like looking at intrinsic probability, like you're saying the stage, like what seems plausible, what seems not plausible before we kind of look at the evidence. Um, yep. And then we're looking, then we go to the evidence and see like, how does the evidence push us in light of these prior considerations and like intrinsic probability. That's and like exactly. what we're really trying to do today is like set that first stage of like, when we're looking at the question, like of does God exist? Well, like, like how, like how probable should we think that God, it is that God exists when we're looking at like these arguments and whatnot. Um, yeah. 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 So some people think, for example, that, it's utterly improbable that there's a God. And so the whole idea that you'd go looking for evidence uh, for theism is just ridiculous. I mean, one really drastic form of this is, you know, people that used to argue that the idea of God's incoherent, right? So, uh, you know, maybe, you know, it's contradictory or maybe, you know, just given some other things we know, it's just, you know, um, it's, you know, just has zero probability of being true, in which case it doesn't make any sense to even go and look at the evidence. And so one of the things that I was um, that I am concerned to do in this larger project, but also in this paper is just argue that, look, you know, the uh, intrinsic probability of theism is relatively high. Um, and, um, you know, I go about arguing for that in a way that's a little different from the way uh, people have argued for it in the past. Mm. OK, yeah, that's super helpful. So thanks for that, Ted. So I'm wondering then, like, 
one of the things that comes up in this debate is like the problem of simplicity. So what is this problem of simplicity and like what's Swinburne's role going to be in this like debate that we're about to get into? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's this, uh, you know, sort of famous argument uh, in, that Karl Popper, Popper gives. Popper was this uh, philosopher of science in the middle part, early and middle part of the 20th century. And so Popper had this idea that like theories technically have zero probability. And the idea is like there's an infinite number of theories, right? And if you were to uh, sort of distribute probability evenly over all the theories, right, then it would have to be the case that each uh, theory gets probability zero. And so Popper uses this as an argument, you know, to say that, you know, scientific theories aren't confirmed, right? That scientific theories are just falsified. And so, you know, that gets into some interesting questions about what the distinction is and then, then whether it's plausible or not. Um, but, um, um, you know, one way of sort of meeting that initial challenge of the idea that, well, there's an infinite number of theories, right? And so they all have zero probability is to defend the idea that theories in general um, can be evaluated on this uh, on the criteria of simplicity. And that gives us a principled way of assigning some theories uh, greater probability than others, right? Now, in order to do this, you want simplicity to be something that has a kind of logical character to it, right? Um, such that, you know, it doesn't seem like it's, you know, question begging or it's just tracking, you know, heuristic judgments or whatever, right? So one of the main sort of uh, things people have talked about in philosophy of science is trying to unpack and defend an idea of simplicity. Elliot Sober, for example, has a really nice book, um, on simplicity that came out a couple years ago, um, and he's he has a he has a very nuanced view about when the simplicity is useful and when it's not. Um, but what Swinburne does is he uh, defends a general view of simplicity, and then uses that to argue that the hypothesis of theism is a simple hypothesis. Now you know there, um, my sort of contribution. Uh, in relation to Swinburne is just to argue is like, okay, look, you know, it's a cost for a view if you have to defend this sort of, you know, really robust or metaphysical account of simplicity. You know, there's some problems with it, um, but it would be easier if you could ground, um, it would be easier, it'd be better, theoretically, if you could ground a relatively high intrinsic probability of theism, where you didn't have to sort of you know, appeal to this really robust conception of simplicity. Hmm. So you're trying to say like, maybe like simplicity, like, like, like how big of a deal should like should, in your view, like how big of a view, like a deal is simplicity? I, I mean, I think it's really important. You know, if someone, I haven't really seen an account of simplicity that, um, you know, I think is um, correct. And so what I'm trying to do is say, all right, well, look, you know, let's use this idea of just, you know, um, th this idea that we have that certain kinds of explanations that are structural explanations tend to do better than explanations that just um, sort of postulate, you know, these limitations that have no explanations for. Them. So mm -hmm. the motivating idea I use in the paper is something like this. It's like, well, you might ask, like, well, why is it that? Um, you know, human beings can't uh, grow to be 100 feet tall, right? Um, and you could just think of it as just a brute fact of the universe. It's like there's some sort of limit, right? And that height just is set as a, as a limit. And people can't get, you know, taller than that. But, you know, you can offer sort of broadly structural explanations for why that is the case. For example, the human heart, right, can only pump blood, you know, over a certain amount of distances, right? And the size and the force that would be required to pump blood, you know, across, you know, everywhere is needed for someone that was hundred feet would be so great that it would destroy the vessels, right. That carry mm -hmm. the blood and so on. Right. So you have something like a, you know, gesturing at a structural explanation for why this can't happen. And so what we're doing there is you're sort of, um, you're explaining one thing in virtue of the structures of something else. 
right? And so in general, the idea is that it's a good marking, it's a good making feature of explanations when you're able to explain a bunch of stuff in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, um, a smaller number of commitments that don't themselves cry out for explanation. And so mm -hmm. we take this, um, you know, this, this idea to look at, um, you know, the plausibility of grand explanatory theories, uh, certain theories, right, have these limitations that have no deeper structural explanations. And so they just cry out for explanation. Um, and it's a strike against that theory that, um, you know, it has no explanation for that. So for example, you know, Hume and uh, the natural dialogues of religion, you know, said, well, you know, couldn't the world be um, created by, you know, the sort of committee of demigods, excuse me. And uh, he says, well, sure, you know, they could have got together, formed like a confederation, right? And, you know, one part does this part, one part does that part, and they all speak it together and create the thing. But like, if you're asking, okay, well, how plausible it is, is it that there's this confederation, right, of limited beings that act in this kind of way, you think, well, you know, there's no deeper explanation. These things are just all positive. And uh, as a feature of fundamental reality, that cries out for explanation. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's super helpful. Like, looking at simplicity, like, I like how you kind of said, like, it's good for us to be able to explain a lot with, like, very few commitments. And that's why simplicity is super important. So, yeah. I'd love to, like, we talked about a little bit about, like, what simplicity is, like, why it matters, um, what intrinsic probability is, why it matters. Um, so let's look at, like, the different ideas here. Um, so you talk about, like, theism, atheism, and, like, axiarchism. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk a, bit, a little bit about, like, how to formulate these three views? Yeah, so, sure. Yeah, so theism, um, you know, you want to formulate theism as such that it's it uh, sort of tracks the core uh views of theism that you find in the world religions. Um, I think the, the sort of the, the best way um, to formulate it has been done by Richard Swinburne. So Swinburne talks about this um, property of, of intentional power, right? So, um, you know, when we act for reasons, right, we are acting in, um, on the basis of intentional power, right? We, I want that, you know, um, that will you know, be something that I'll enjoy. So I'm going to do it. And that's sort of, so I'm going to do it, right? It's an exercise of intentional power. And Swinburne thinks that you could understand theism as the hypothesis that there's a being of intentional power that has no limitations on it, mm -hmm. right? So it's pure, limitless, intentional power. And then he thinks that a lot of the traditional um, properties of a perfect being follow from that. Uh, so uh, this being would be omniscient because it would be a limitation on intentional power not to, to um, form right uh, an intention right to know some fact and not be able to know that fact right um, you know this being would uh, you know in virtue of omniscience would know right all the relevant moral facts and would have you know reasons to act for those facts uh, because it's a feature of the content of goodness that you're moved to um, act for those things. And there'd be no sort of outside uh, desires that would sort of war against or provide, you know, um, motivations for acting against this. So this would be a being, right, that knows all the facts and uh, will always perform, right, good actions. And so, you know, I talk a little bit about that in the paper, but, you know, I think people, if they're interested, they should just go read Swinburne on this because he's very clear, very good um, mm -hmm. on how to articulate this. So atheism, um, I take the best view of atheism to be something like a many worlds uh, atheist view. You know, so if you're thinking about, you know, uh, single world atheism that just post postulates you know a single universe that has these various properties i mean it's going to sort of cry out for explanation like okay well why these properties why not these other properties and so i think the you know the best version of atheism is one that says okay well look you know there's sort of this uh, multiverse right uh that exists where every physical possibility right is realized in some world or other um 
And uh, if you're thinking in terms of, you know, what cries out for explanation on that view, you do get, you know, a lot of explanations. Um, you know, why does this world have this feature as well? You know, in the same way that, you know, we're here and not there. I mean, it's just a feature of the view, right? That um, we're gonna find ourselves um, in life permitting universes with various features and so on. Um, and then the other view is um, the axiarchist view is a view that I think you find in, you know, maybe some of the Neoplatonist thinkers, but also um, perhaps in certain kind, certain religious traditions, so certain kinds of Hinduism. Um, and this is the view that, you know, there's kind of a normative force to the universe. It's impersonal, but um, in a way it's creatively effective, right? Um, the way that uh, Leslie Parfit uh, formulates it is it's the principle that, um, uh, you know, good things exist because they ought to exist, right? I don't know if that's exactly the right way uh, to formulate it. I want to tie it more into um, the other kind of religious traditions that we see in these kind of impersonal views of, um, you know, Brahman and these kind of Neoplatonist views, um, uh, you know, of the one. Um, so I think that the, those three views um, have a lot of, you know, plausibility to them. If you're just thinking about, you know, how they sort of work in terms of explanation and um, they certainly don't posit, um, you know, particular sort of limitations that you're just thinking, well, you know, why is it that rather than this other thing? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, I think that those are three really serious views that we should consider um, and argue that um, in the paper, I argue that these are the three views that we should consider. And so that we could distribute probability over them evenly and then look at the evidence. Um, but in terms of the overall strategy, and this is something I say in the paper, is like, it really doesn't matter that there are three. I mean, there could be four, there could be five, there could be a hundred. I mean, mm -hmm. really what the concern is, is that you just don't want the space of views to be infinite, you know, because then you're right back into the same problem of like, well, how do you distribute probability, right, over a yeah. number of views? Okay, yeah, that's super helpful. So thanks, Dr. Poston. So like in your view then, when we're thinking about like theism and atheism and axiarchism, you're kind of looking at it and saying like, yeah, before we look at like the evidence, they're all kind of like equally probable. Is that how you see it? Yeah. Awesome. So I'm wondering then like, maybe talk about like, why is this the case? Like talk about maybe, I don't know if you can do it one by one, but like how are they going to end up being like equal when we're looking at like the field of intrinsic probability? How are they going to be equal? Yeah, so, um, I mean, think, think about a case where, right, you have, a, you, have um, you know, um, a, a six-sided die, right? And you're wondering, you know, which pip's going to come up, right? Is it going to be the, which side's going to come up? The, what, the side with one pip, the side with two pips, and so on, right? And so uh, there, right, it seems reasonable to think, well, we don't have any relevant information, and so we're just all going to set them, they all have the same, you know, chance of, landing up right and if you're thinking you know if you use that sort of idea it's like in the case where we don't have any information that would favor you know one possibility over another then we set them as having equal probability and so that's the that's the same idea you know in this case is like we've got three views right they seem equally um uh plausible in terms of like their explanatory properties um, without consideration of the evidence. And so we don't have any more reason to think that one of them is going to be true than the other. And so we should set them equal probability. Okay. So you see the views kind of equal. Like, so obviously theism and atheism and axiarchism are all kind of asserting different like things at the fundamental level. So I'm trying to see, so like theism, like, um, like saying like there is a god and atheism like there is no god and you want to like flush it out further some sort of like many worlds atheism um yeah. so you see like they're like is it the same kind like number of assertions or like how exactly is it coming to it like where you see them as like equally plausible oh yeah yeah so so um if you think of like atheism as just the negation of theism right then it's compatible with with a number of views but what we're looking for in these like grand explanatory theories is that we're looking for something like natural answers to a why question, 
Mm. Right. So we have, you know, uh, we're interested in these theories because we're interested in, you know, a, a good answer to a why question. And so we want to know, like, OK, where'd the world come from? Why does the world have these features? Why are there human beings? You know, why? Why are we? You know, why do we act for reasons? Why are we aware, right, of, um, you know, uh, value uh, broadly as aesthetic value and moral value and so on and so forth. And so, right, um, um, if you're thinking about it from that perspective, right, it's not enough just to have the view as like, oh, well, that view is false, right? So you may think, oh, theism is false. It's like, well, that doesn't answer a why question for me. It tells me what one, you know, uh, view isn't. An answer to the why question. So then, yeah, I want to know. Okay, so what's your view? Why? How are you going to answer these questions? Hmm. Okay, so when you're saying like when you flesh out this eight like atheism further, like whatever your view may be, like that's where you're going to really see like simplicity kind of come back to uh, a view that's like equivalent to theism. Yeah, yeah, you're going to come come back to a sort of a metaphysical account that explains, you know, the features that we observe in reality in terms of more fundamental features. Hmm. Okay, so I wonder, like, maybe, like, could the atheists, like, say they have an advantage in saying, like, there's a bunch of different views, like, maybe, like, they have the many worlds view, and, like, that's maybe, like, even the theism on, like, intrinsic probability, but then, like, shouldn't, like, couldn't they have other views, like, maybe there's, like, the, this universe view, and there's, like, the some universes view, like, they add all these different kinds of views of, like, different views of atheism, like, could that help them, like, as atheism as the negation of theism, like, really build up their, like, intrinsic probability? Yeah, I mean, that's one way they could they could go. I mean, in the paper, like, you know, I say this world and, you know, the some world views are just really implausible, uh, you know, because they're, you know, structurally, they just, you know, posit these, you know, there's just, just take the this world view. It's like, there's just this world, right, with these properties, right? And you think, okay, well, the properties could have been very different, right? Um, why just these, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh you know, you can give an answer for that, right? I mean, I think the best answer for that is the move to something like a multiverse. Um, or you could say, no, it's just a fundamental feature of the world that we're just in this single universe that has these, you know, contingent features and that's just it, right? And, um, you know, in the paper, I was like, well, that view is just not very plausible. And so I'm not going to give it any probability. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I think that's helpful. So thanks, Dr. Boston. So, one of the arguments that you kind of respond to is like Draper's like low priors argument. It's yeah. so like, what is Draper's argument? And like, how would you respond to it? Yeah. So Draper's low priors argument has two parts to it, right? The first part is where he says that, um, uh, theism, uh, what he calls omnitheism and, um, like source physicalism or atheism, uh, both account for the evidence. Right. I think you might even say that uh, source, source physicalism um, accounts for the evidence a little bit better. But just suppose that, you know, they both account for the evidence the same way. Um, so then there's not going to be a difference in terms of their uh, probability with respect to the evidence. Right? And so in order to get a low prior for theism or a low probability for theism, you have to argue that theism has a really low prior probability. And the way he does that is he says, okay, well, there are these two views. There's source physicalism and source idealism. And source physicalism is the view that fundamentally, right, um, uh, the world is physical and that consciousness, you know, or minds arise out of the physical, right? And so atheism, uh, on his view, is just any particular form of source physicalism. And then he says, but look, you know, there are different kinds of source idealism, right? You could be a Barclayan idealist, you could be, you know, um, you know, <laughs> you could be a theist, you could be, you know, um, you know, something, you know, like, uh, you know, I mean, just <laughs> lots of different forms of ideals, like there's, mm -hmm. you know, limited mind, right? And, you know, so on and so forth, right? Um, and so he argues, well, you know, we're going to have to give all those views equal probability. And since theism is just a really particular version of this, it's just going to have low um, probability relative to source uh, physicalism. Um, and so what I say in the paper there is I say, OK, well, you know, you've got to apply the same sort of explanatory uh, 
you know, account that I want to sort of use to, you know, kind of substitute um, this more general idea of simplicity and say, okay, well, if we're going to look at varieties of source idealism, right, ones that posit finite minds as sort of the ultimate explanation are ones that are going to have these limitations to that have no deeper structural um, explanation. And so in my view, right, they're not going to be, they're not going to rise to the level of plausibility. And so they're not going to yeah. be things that we're going to give um, any positive probability to, you know, and then um, if you do that, right, then, you know, you're sort of back into the earlier argument that I presented, where it turns out that, you know, the view that um, sort of is the best sort of explanatorily virtuous view prior to the evidence is that there's, you know, uh, one substance of, you know, with one property uh, being a pure uh, limitless intentional power. And then, uh, you know, that view gets as much probability as source physicalism does. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, that, that's helpful, Ted, uh, Dr. Poston. Um, yes, so, um, so we're looking at Draper's argument, and you have like source physicalism and source idealism. Um, okay, and you're trying to say like what exactly? See, would you say that like Draper's argument like ineffective or like it, it's not super strong? Like, where exactly are you on? That? Well, I would disagree with him that uh, when you distribute probability amongst like the source um, idealist views that theism is just going to be one of the many views there that you're going to give positive probability to. Okay. I would argue that no, theism is the one that you're going to give, um, you know, the lion's share of probability to. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm wondering then Dr. Poston, I think we kind of hit this question, but like you would say like, you're not restricting the three views that you offer in the paper when we're looking at intrinsic probability. Like, you're not saying it's not just theism, atheism, and archaeism but it's like there, there are more, more views here. Um, I mean, there could be, you know, it's, it's not like, I mean, I, you know, honestly, that's what I think. I mean, I think there are these three views, um, but you know, someone can come along and say, Oh, well, what about this? view? I was like, Oh, okay. Well, I didn't get that one. Right. So let's have four. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I mean, my view is like, I think these are the three candidate plausible views um, in terms of, you know, um, ultimate sort of explanations of the nature of reality. Um, but it's not like, you know, if there's more, right, it's not a big problem with the overall argument. Okay. Yeah, that's super helpful. So thanks for that, Dr. Poston. Um, the last thing I kind of want to talk about here, um, and we'll kind of paint a big picture to finish it off, is like, okay. like are there any indifference principles at play here when we're looking at... Um, your views here in the paper and intrinsic probability and all this fun stuff? Yeah. So uh, principle of indifference is one way of um, sort of generating probabilities, right? And so the idea behind a principle of indifference is that, right, if you don't have any uh, reason to think one possibility is more likely than another possibility, then you should give them even probability. Um, and principles of indifference um, notoriously um, lead to contradictions, right? So I think the one I give in the paper is if you know that someone's traveled, um, you know, I can't remember what it is. They've traveled like, you know, um, uh, what, two, two minutes or something like that, right? Um, I can't remember what it was. But, um, I mean, you just, you can look at the paper, you can look online for the veteran paradoxes. And they're just things where, like, you can set up cases uh, where one way of thinking about it, you generate a probability of saying, you know, like, oh, you know, it's um, like, you know, uh, it's like equally likely that this person traveled the distance between, say, like, you know, uh, a minute and a minute 30 and equally likely that they did it, in, you know, like uh, a minute 30 to like two minutes. Right. And then you can describe it another way where instead of using the time traveled, you use the speed travel and you think, OK, well, you know, travel will either be like 30 miles an hour to 45 miles an hour or 45 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour. And then it turns out like just these different ways of describing the same thing. Right. Generate incompatible probabilities. Mm -hmm. OK, lots of sort of examples of this, but 
Um, so people who want to use something like an indifference principle are always interested in kind of restricting um, its use. And so you need to know something about, um, you know, the relevant uh, space that you're um, generating probabilities among, right? So like in the, in, um, you know, in the case where uh, you don't know a lot about the situation, it seems wrong to use an indifference principle. But in another case where you have a firm grasp on what the relevant possibilities are, and you're, you think that you have a good way, a principled way of describing those, uh, then you can use an indifference principle. And so what I'm doing in the paper and sort of, you know, I'm, I think I mentioned this in a footnote or something, is that um, if we're using this idea of like looking at explanatory limitations as a way of distributing probability, right, then we're getting at, you know, a robust feature of the views um, that it seems that we can distribute probability evenly among those views. Okay. So we're looking at the idea that like, since like we can distribute the probabilities evenly because we can kind of like robustly like articulate them. Yeah. Because we, we have a firm grasp of the, of the space of possibilities. So here's a, here's oh, a, here's, okay. That's helpful. Here's, here's a case um, that maybe uh, would be helpful. Like, so suppose like there's an area of the world, like a country that you don't know a lot about. Right. Uh, and there's uh you know, one traveler is describing the, the country as having region A and region B, right? And another travel traveler, you know, describes uh, the country as having five regions, you know, one through five, right? And you think, well, what's the probability that, uh, uh, you know, this person who's from this region of the country lives, right, in region A? And you might think, oh, well, you know, if you're just thinking about the descriptions of region A and region B, you think, well, you know, if I'm an indifference person, um, you know, I might think it's probability is one half. Mm -hmm. right? But then you think, well, what's the probability that they live in, you know, region uh, four, right? And you think, well, you know, if I'm an indifference person, I might think it's, you know, uh, one fifth because there are five regions dividing probability evenly. Um, what if it, now it could turn out like, you know, uh, region A just contains regions one through four and region B contains uh, region uh, five, right? In which case, right, you think the probability that they live in, um, you know, region A um, is um, going to be incompatible with the probability that they live in, you know, region, you know, four or five or something like that. Mm-hmm. Right. And there it's just you just don't have like there's no. Um, I mean, your descriptions of the regions are sort of just linguistic, right? They're not sort of grasp, grasping on to sort of, you know, uh, the sort of the physical sort of distribution of the land. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so it's not a great explanation. Um, you know, I might uh, I might send you something over email, you know, to give a little better explanation. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, the the upshot is that I mean, you really just need to make sure that you're sort of when you're distributing probability, you're distributing probability, you know, among possibilities that map to sort of you know fundamental features of reality. Mm -hmm. It's almost like I think of it like I think I'm kind of grasping what you're saying because it's like the more we know about something, the less there is, like, the less there's going to be for, like, indifference principle. Like, the more we grasp about, like, looking at this, like, big debate on, like, is there a God? When we got, like, theism and atheism and axiotheism, the more we know and the more we discover, the less room there is going to be for these indifference principles to kind of, like, just destroy our probabilities of any of these views. Um, yeah. Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. I mean, another sort of way to think about it is it's kind of like if you're showing someone you know, around the university and you're like, well, here's the biology building, right? And here's the chemistry building. Here's the, mm -hmm. you know, the theater building. And they're like, oh, this is all great, but where's the university? And you're like, well, what do you, what do you mean? These are the particular buildings. And they're like, yeah, but you haven't shown me the building that's the university. And you're like, no, you don't understand, right? These, you know, collection of buildings, this is the entire university. So there it's kind of like a category mistake. Mm -hmm. right? And so when you're distributing probabilities, I mean, you're you're uh, 
hoping that you're not sort of, you know, making some sort of uh, category mistake where you're distributing, like, you know, you're thinking, oh, well, there are 10 buildings here, right? One of those is going to be the university. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's super helpful. So thanks for that, Dr. Potion. So yeah. we, we've we talked about this. Maybe to wrap things up, like you've kind of talked about like intrinsic intrinsic probability and like why it matters and like how you think like theism and atheism and archaeism are kind of going to be equal um, when we're looking at intrinsic probability. I know you've done a lot of work on like cumulative cases for theism and whatnot, but in a few minutes, like how do you go from there to like becoming a theist? Yeah, so um, that's the second part of the book that I'm working on, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, if you're given that a view is plausible, then you just look for the relevant evidence, right? And so what I would do in that case is I'd say, okay, well, then let's figure out what the relevant evidence is. And so just, you know, offhand, we could take, you know, the evidence of design that we find in the world, you know, so some of the fine-tuning evidence, for example. Um, and you think, okay, so which of these views best explains that, right? You think, okay, but in addition to knowing that the world's designed, right, we know that uh, or, excuse me, in virtue of knowing that the world has features, right, they call out for explanation, right? We also know that it contains conscious agents, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to know which of the three views would explain, you know, um, uh, would it, would best explain, you know, that they're conscious, you know, people. Um, then you look at sort of normativity and you think, look, you know, people have, um, can, you know, latch on to, both aesthetic and moral value, you know, which of the three views would explain that. And so what I would do, um, you know, in the second part of the book is just say, look, you know, theism provides, you know, a better explanation for these features of reality than the others. And so if you're thinking about how the probability is sort of changing and growing over time, right, if you're starting out with each view has a probability of a third, excuse me, and then you look at the particular evidence, Right, you see that uh, the probability of theism is going up, and the probability of these other views is is going down. And so, at the end of the day, you end up with um, you know the probability of theism being relatively high. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's super helpful, Doctor Boston. So thanks for that. Um, I appreciate a lot of this conversation. It's been super helpful. Um, and I'd love to do something again as you get closer and closer to getting this project out. Um, yeah, do you have any like last thoughts or things you want to say before we wrap up like today's conversation? Uh, I mean, I think it's really important for people to, um, you know, think about, um, you know, the evidence that they have for their views, you know, and it's a really, Im Im you know, important for, um, you know, uh, I think Christians in particular to, you know, realize that there are other very intelligent, you know, people out there, thoughtful people that are concerned you know, with their own views. And so it's one of the things I like about the Swinburne project is that it just gives a, you know, sort of a, a common framework for people to talk about, okay, well, you know, how plausible are the views themselves? You know, how well do the, how well, you know, does the views, you know, explain the evidence? And so, um, you know, <laughs> my sort of, you know, what, when I teach philosophy of religion, you know, we talk about this stuff, you know, I tell, tell my students, I was like, look, you know, don't be scared to look at the evidence and don't be scared to, you know, um, you know, uh, try to articulate, you know, your reasons. I mean, this is just, you know, the way uh, that, you know, people have conversations about big theories. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I'd really just, you know, would encourage people to check out some of the relevant books. Uh, Richard Swinburne wrote, um, a uh, sort of a smaller version of his book, The Existence of God, called Is There a God? And I've uh, mentioned that to a lot of people, you know. And so, um, you know, just I would encourage people to, you know, continue to think about these issues and, you know, use some of the resources that you can find online and in your local library. Hmm. Well, Dr. Poston, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate you and your work. How can people like follow you and connect with you and things like that? Yeah, so I actually, during the pandemic, I started a YouTube channel. Uh, so it's uh, TED Talks Philosophy. <laughs> and I'm going to put oh, up, up there, um, I'm, gonna st I'm starting a series on philosophy of religion. So I'm going to go through some of, the, um, some of the major books in philosophy of religion. So uh, people can check out that. And then I have a website, it's tedposton.org, um, and uh, it should be, um, I think it's .orbirds.com, I don't really know, but um, yeah, those are two ways to, uh, you know, follow and see what's going on.
I'm going to put up a outline of the book that I'm working on. And my hope is that when chapters get, um, you know, uh, to places where I'm comfortable with them, I'll just go ahead and put those drafts up as well. Mm. Well, Dr. Poston, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate um, you and your work. I'd encourage people to check it out. Um, and yeah, that's that. I'll put the link down below for you, how you can follow and connect with Dr. Poston. And um, that's it for today. This is here in Apologetics. Super pumped you join us today. If you're new, I encourage you to like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And if you value what we do, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash here to Apologetics. Dr. Poston, thank you so much for coming on today. Really appreciate your time to give me a lot to think about. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Zach. All right. Have a good one, everyone. And God bless. We'll catch you next time.